Garland. I'm Phil. I'm the principal here at Little City. I'm so glad that we're all here together to discuss the very important topic of how to, how to unlock distance learning while creating closer connections. We welcome you. Our students welcome you. This is a slide with our presenters. You're going to be meet, meeting them each one by one as each of us have an important part of our story to tell. And we're really, as we begin, it's a starting gate of what we're, what we're talking about. We'd like to begin with a poll question. The first poll question is, I think, mean, I, I think our school, meaning your school, is doing a very good job with e-learning for our gen ed students, but we are having a harder time providing effective e-learning for our special education students. For your school, please vote either strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. Are you doing that? We've got about 63% voted. Once we get to about 75, make sure to um, click one of the options of your, on your poll there. And I'll close the poll in just a few more seconds and share the responses with the team. Okay, here's the results, Bill. Can you see them? Uh, I, I cannot see the result. Okay, the, okay. the results are strongly agree at 29%. Agree at 60%, disagree at 10%, and strongly disagree at 1%. So most 60% say, say that they would agree with that statement. Wow, very good. And then, uh, and at some level, that's 89% are in some are, are in agreement with that. With 29 at partial and 60%. So we're we're really like at at, uh, at 90 there. That's wonderful. Interesting. Uh, thank you, Arlen. So. Uh, when we're looking at when we're looking at the process of e-learning, what we where we where we begin is beginning with multiple with multiple intelligence learning. So as we begin to unlock the process, what we did at our school, which we'd like to share with you, is we began answer we we began asking ourselves before we started anything else, is that is looking at the end first, at the conclusion of what we really wanted to be presenting and getting back from our students was, what could we produce that would be most visual? What could be the hands-on activities that come out of the e-learning of the e exercises that we're doing? How does the connection of the human voice transcend the time and the place and the new normal that we're in? And what are the best kinds of multiple intelligence connectors that work best with e-learning, beginning with, with beginning with e-learning training for staff and then moving to engagement and assessment for students and then concluding and linking in the, the interactions and the relationships between the, 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 our, the school and the, and the folks at home. And we'd like to present a, a, a premise to you. We talk about it, if we can make it here, that you can make it anywhere. We believe that the processes that we're beginning to share with you here are transferable to your school. No matter how profound the special needs are at your school, wherever you're located throughout the state, we believe that the kinds of process we're talking about here today will be of help to you. And we, we, certainly, we certainly hope so. At this time, uh, Arlen, I'd like you to please roll up the first video, which talks about um, a little bit more about Little City. And after the video, I'll be introducing Rich Bobby, our Chief Program Officer. Okay, here comes the video. Hopefully this will show for everybody. All right, let me hit play.
Okay, Phil, I'm going to take it back to you. And Phil, can you still uh, hear us? Okay. Thank you for giving me back the screen and our PowerPoint, I'm sure will. Okay, can you all see the, the, the PowerPoint? Yep, looking good, Phil. Very good. At this time, I'd like to, to introduce Rich Bobby, our Chief Program Officer, to talk about our connecting of staff as process. Thank you, Phil. My name is Rich Bobby. I'm the Chief Program Officer of our services at Little City. It is a pleasure to have you all join us for this very exciting event, this presentation. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank our team here for putting together an uh, incredible uh, presentation. Uh, truly, we are blessed with a dynamic team who is filled with skills and talents that uh, have certainly emerged in this process. So thank you to our team, and I look forward to each of you being able to see the great work that they're doing. So Little City has been around for over 60 years. We're a nonprofit lo located in Palatine, Illinois. And I will say that you know the, the part that I love about the work that I do is every day we have the ability to make a difference in someone else's life. Most of the individuals that we serve are individuals who have autism, intellectual and developmental disabilities. When we look at the challenges we face with serving this population, in particular uh, in our children's school, as well as our residential program that's located in Palatine, is about 80% of the youth that we serve have autism, and I would say about 80% of those youth have challenges, challenges with communicating verbally. And so when we really look at the, the challenges we face, uh, it's beyond just the day-to-day -day school activities. What we found is that youth who have autism and intellectual and developmental disabilities really crave consistency and, and thrive on that skill building activities, not just in the school environment, but also in, the, in their home environment. And one challenge that we were constantly faced with is how do we create that environment where the skill acquisition is consistent between the home and school? whether it be the residential home or a community home where our students may live with their families. And in that ongoing struggle, we've looked at how do we create a platform that could create communication, activities, activities of daily living, socialization, and really build those specific skills in the work that we do. So on our quest, we were looking for some sort of platform that we could use to really focus on that, those skill building activities. And one day earlier this calendar year, uh, on my computer, I got an update from our IT department, and there was this app that popped up that said Microsoft Teams. I'm like, okay, what's this? We, we took a look at it, and as we dug deeper into it, we really found that it was profound in the ability of communicating between our residential program as well as our school, and began to branch that out even to our community students. And when we did this, this we were very fortunate. We were like, wow, we found a tool that we could use to really help bridge that connection and communication between home and school environment. Then COVID-19 hit. So when COVID-19 hits, fortunately, because we already had a platform, out the gate, we already had a means of really kicking off the learning experience from day one. Did it go without kinks? Absolutely not. It didn't, was not a, a, a it didn't go without its challenges, and Jessica certainly will articulate what those challenges were. But I will say what's profound about this is that this experience in this platform, whether it be Microsoft Teams or Zoom or other technical platforms that are out there, this has really brought us closer together between our staff, our school staff, and our residential staff, and our staff and our students. And despite the distance that we have between us, we have actually have come through this experience feeling closer and better connected with our students, families, and our staff internally. And in this process, we've also discovered the amazing strengths and talents that many of our staff have. And certainly that would be articulated in this presentation. And what we found was that individuals that we don't typically have the chance to talk to on a day-to-day -day basis because we're constantly in the whirlwind of the day-to-day -day activities, really these talents emerged to the point of we created this robust process of e-learning, whether it be pre-recorded or live streaming of activities related to individuals who have autism and intellectual and developmental disabilities. 
So I'm very excited for you all to be able to join us in this experience. And I hope you, uh, again, appreciate the great work that our team has done. And you know, thank you all for what you've done in creating this amazing presentation. Back to you, Phil. Thank you very much, Rich. And then as I introduce Jessica Kinji, who is our school therapy and clinical coordinator, uh, Arlen, after this first slide, we'll, we'll cut to our next video, please. So uh, Jessica, Jessica Kinji. Yes, thank you, everyone. So, you know, Rich just talked about, we had a platform by which to come together, but what we really needed was a process. But before we could start on that process, we first needed to process all as a team what was going on. And we found that it was somewhat synonymous with the five stages of grief as we've outlined here. And so it, it was the initial shock and denial of it all. You know, we by nature are planners and we had no time to plan for this. Many of us didn't wanna believe it, um, but when we got past that and we realized that they weren't kidding and we really weren't going back to in-person learning for a while, um, we got a little bit frustrated. And so we were frustrated for many things. We were frustrated for the situation. We were frustrated for the kids, for the systems or lack thereof, or um, lack of access to those systems. You know, by nature, we are fixers. And when we can't fix things, well, we get a little bit upset. And so next came that uh, we needed to start negotiating and bargaining and rethinking our expectations. We needed to think about what we can expect these kids and these families um, and our group homes to really be able to do and what we could expect our staff to do as well. Um, you know, we started to feel a little bit bad and we missed the old way and, and we really missed being together, you know, but we decided early on that this was something um, that could make us better or better. And we chose to take the situation and use it to make us better. Our kids and our, our staff needed us now more than ever. And so we truly rose to the occasion. Um, and we moved on to that fifth stage of kind of acceptance and appreciation. And we discovered how truly strong we could be. And like Rich said, it, it hasn't been an easy process. These last nine weeks, you know, when we look back of all that we've learned, it's it's been a bit of a blur. Um, it's still not easy. There's days, I'm not going to lie, where it's not easy, um, but it's a process. And in doing so, we've been able to unveil so many individual strengths and talents and uniqueness, and it's helped us work together in a whole new way, and it's bonded us in new ways. And so we'll do a quick clip of kind of those stages, and then I'll go a bit further into how we worked through that from shock all the way to appreciation. Great. Thank you very much, Jessica. And Arlen, if you can run the next clip, the next uh, video clip, please. Thank you. Whoa, where'd you go? I'm sorry. That's okay. Hi, Evan. What do you say? Hi, Heather. He's trying to tap the screen to hang up. Oh. <laughs> and then just tell me hi and then we can be all done. Say bye, Heather. Yay! It's not just moms that need to take out garbage. Everyone can help, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, I figured that out. I'm like, you know what? Why am I doing all this? <laughs> just a little piss. Why do I not like the little piss place music? Because you like to have control over the music and it's hard when you don't, buddy. Being able to see the kids and see their smile is wonderful. It's just a hands-on thing and it's not the same like being face-to-face. -face. And also I miss Miss Jeanette every morning. You know, the residential start side just stepped up. They, you know, kept coming in. They had a smile on their face. There was no time to freak out. You know, the kids needed to get taken care of and they're still going, you know? so. My heart's with them and I and I appreciate all they do. Appreciate is a weak word for these guys. They go far and beyond that word. You want to go out and give them a big hug, I guess. Thank you, Arlen. And so there you see it. You know, how though, how did we take this pandemic and, and move a team of truly talented teachers and therapists and administrators and students um, and their families 
to a whole new level despite all of this distance. And so this first slide breaks down that process. Um, we had to allow people time to grieve and get over the shock of it all. And we really had to acknowledge for them, yes, this situation, it, it stinks, it isn't fair. Um, and sometimes acknowledging all of those feelings is half the battle because once those feelings were validated, it really invigorated our team in, in ways where they were able to start jumping over all of these hurdles, each hurdle that came in front of us and, and even hurdles that we didn't know that existed when we started this race, we really had to stop and take a closer look. We needed to step outside of ourselves um, and we needed to look at them. We needed to look at our students and we looked at them as individuals, but we also looked at them as groups of students. And so how could we combine all of their individual differences and the family dynamics um, and the different living situations to make it easier for everyone? Um, before we could start to plan, we, we essentially, we needed a roadmap. We needed a framework and we needed systems in place. And then we needed to decide a plan. Um, and we needed to make sure that that plan was truly one that would work for each of our students and our family situations. Otherwise, we knew we would just go back to being frustrated. Um, nothing's harder than, than making a great plan and it doesn't work, but that was part of the process. So next came the fun and we were able to educate and create. And essentially we were tasked with writing our own owner's manual and handing over the keys and some of the control. And we had to show non-teachers and non-therapists and non-educators how to take on this new role um, that they had essentially been thrown into that they never even applied for. And so we had to, to really get real with them and, and be real and stay real. You know, um, our expectations, you know, we couldn't set them in a way that we would lead to be being disappointed. We needed to minimize that disappointment. And we couldn't forget that, you know, our parents and our guardians and our group home workers, they aren't teachers and they aren't therapists and they shouldn't be expected to be. Um, and like many of us, we they're probably doing about seven different jobs right now um, between not only are, are many of our, our parents working from home themselves, but they're also juggling the role of now full time mom or dad, maybe single parent uh, juggling their own children's e learning on top of, of teaching everyone else. And so I just think that um, all, all of these things were going on while they were navigating keeping everyone safe and, and fed and alive during a pandemic, you know, and, and it's not, it wasn't easy. And so I think that although our team worked so diligently on, you know, a perfect math sheet or a perfect therapeutic maintenance plan, we just also had to be real and know that that might not be the life vest that they needed right now. It might that didn't mean they weren't going to use it ever, but maybe in the moment when we made that call and they didn't, we didn't get an answer on the other side, that um, it wasn't, didn't mean that they weren't ever going to use it. And so we really had to move to accept all of these differences. You know, some of our families, um, they were speaking and some of them were sailing and some of them were really doing both of those things, sometimes multiple times a day, multiple times an hour. And so when we have families that differ in engagement and in their ability to juggle and their ability to communicate with us and just keep up, we have to account for all of that. And so it's really important that we allow time to reflect and see the silver linings. Um, you know, never before had we been allowed to be so close with our families and literally on a camera in the family home to see the different dynamics that were going on. Um, we needed to give them a plethora of praise. And, and really, sometimes you just need to hear, you're doing a good job and you got this. And when they don't, as we all have moments when we don't got this, <laughs> we really needed to give them the tools. It was our job so that they knew that they could do it and that we would get through this together. And we're still doing that. Um, moving on, you know, it's it's about staying strong and, and building strength and remembering that um, they are really relying on us right now. And so I beg you, just don't miss that opportunity. Um, I think in terms of, of 
building those strengths within our relationships with not only our students, but the other people in their life right now. But in doing so, we also have to remember what's most important. You know, we have to be strong, but also remember to stay soft. And all of the statutory requirements and, and regulations that we're trying to keep up with in this process, it's, it's very simple, you know, knowing, having the ability for people to know that we are here for them and that we support them and that we know how hard this is and that we appreciate them. You know, it's, it's as simple and as complicated as that. And it, saying that to each family looks a little bit different and that's okay. Um, for some of our families, they really needed to know, how do I use this communication device you just gave me? And others, it was, what, do I, what am I supposed to do with my child now that I have them for an extra six and a half hours a day? Um, we had to sort the logistics. Uh, we had to prep them for success. And that was beyond just materials or papers or communication devices being delivered, but it was the support that they needed. What did each family need so that they didn't feel the need to give up and they knew that we weren't gonna give up on them? And then getting feedback, having those real and hard conversations with them. Again, they're probably just needing to hear that we know that they're doing their best and that's all we're asking. So we did. In the end, we had to let go of a lot of control um, like I said earlier, you know, we wrote this manual as best we could, but at the end of the day, we, we handed the keys to someone else. Um, we kind of had to jump into the passenger seat via a Zoom call or a Microsoft Teams call. Um, and, you know, we weren't driving anymore. And so it was really important for us to be honest and authentic and genuine and letting people know how much we appreciated and valued them, both of our families and our staff, and really praising them for, for rising to the occasion. I mean, it's a situation that no one expected and no one asked for. And, you know, we did it with little to no training. Um, on top of all of the obligations and then the circuses we were already running. And so I think that even if we can teach others to to be the best juggler in the circus you know we also have to recognize that every once in a while the ball's still going to drop and and that's okay and the show must go on so thank you phil thank you thank you jessica very much at this time we'd like to ask the a second poll question which is how many students at your school have computer access for e-learning at home is it 100% of our students have computer access at home, 75 to 99% of our students have computer access at home, 51 to 74% of our students have computer access at home, or 50% or less of our students have computer access at home. Please vote now. The polls are open. And while the, while the polls are opening here, is something that sitting here as the, as the principal of Little City, one of the things that, that I feel, and I know so many of you all who are fellow principals, superintendents, other educational leaders, we know that our responsibility is to ignite and connect and engage. And I know I speak for all of us, we're so grateful to the Illinois Principals Association for giving us forums such as this and all the materials that they share with us in order to do that better. And so as, as, as we think together collectively, all of us on this call of how we ignite, connect and engage together, we wanted to give you a view of what it's like from, um, from within our virtual classrooms. And I'd like to, to begin that view with Jason Cohn, who is both a a, a speech therapist at our school, as well as um, as our as our runs our technology department at our school as well. This clip back here, and sorry, we, uh, we Oops, sorry, I'm trying to get this slide here. Oops, sorry. Are you all able to see this tutorial slide here? 
Yeah, I think all right there on that one. Uh, ready? All right. Uh, so uh, moving to this sort of brave new world, uh, we had to have a lot of different expectations for our staff in the school, and a lot of this was with things that they've they've really not done anything like before. So uh, we had to kind of come back into one of our our strengths as educators, and that's just sort of looking at uh, video modeling, not for time, but rather for uh, for staff. Um, one of the things that sort of comes up is uh, if you're asking staff to sort of utilize Microsoft Teams in our case for a, a new utility, we could, were able to use Microsoft Teams itself to actually make recordings, uh, showing demonstrations of screen captures on how to sort of uh, do stuff within Microsoft Teams, how to integrate with Zoom, things of that nature. And uh, in doing that, there's a couple little uh, pitfalls that you want to look out for. Uh, one of them is differences that may exist between platforms. Um, Right over here, we're using uh, mobile platforms in our group homes, uh, iPads. Uh, so those need to be able to interface with uh, our, our desktop or laptop computers. And because of that, sometimes there can be some, some differences in these tutorials that I'm making for staff. So uh, it may become necessary to uh, make one for, for separate platforms. Um, uh, you wanna, when making these videos, you wanna generally be pretty brief about it. Uh, really no time for setup, uh, no intro. You just wanna kinda get into the basics of what you're asking staff to do. Um, and then uh, one final thing that I kinda realized re later on is that uh, one of the big pitfalls can be simple acts of menu navigation. So uh, maybe just kind of dancing a mouse around a certain menu selection, leaving it highlighted as long as possible, things like that to make sure that uh, staff are really clear on, on what steps you're highlighting. Uh, during the tutorial process. Um, thanks, Phil. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to introduce Ben Mapes, who is our head teacher, to talk to begin talking about uh, beginning with curriculum. Hi, thank you, Phil. Uh, I'm Ben Mapes. I'm the lead teacher, so I'm the uh, the teacher's teacher at Little City. Um, when we're talking about the academic process here, uh, we're going to be looking at the same basic questions that you look at whenever you're planning instruction. Um, first off, what does a student need to learn? This part didn't change. This is the curriculum that your district or your school decides on, the IEP goals, the state standard. All that stayed the same. What changed was the rest of it. Uh, the next question, what can the student be expected to complete? Uh, you got to meet your students where they are. Recognize that learning at home is not the same as learning at school. Some of your students, especially the ones with special needs, are not going to be able to jump straight into e-learning. Uh, we're gonna have to teach the students how to use this new system. You gotta teach the system before you teach with the system. Uh, we've also gotta start looking at teaching parents. Uh, parents have become our substitute teachers and paras, and a lot of them do not have an education background. So we need to reach out to them and give them a parent playbook or a tips and tricks guide or something like that to help them make this e-learning process as beneficial as possible. Uh, having things in there like ensuring to designate learning spots that are not on the couch right in front of the TV. Uh, how to prompt the students, when to prompt the students, uh, how to pace out your lessons. And if you're using any specific vocabulary in your lessons, uh, make sure you share that so that it can be reinforced from the home side. The next question is what kind of resources do I have access to? I've got it split up to uh, high tech, low tech, and next to no tech. Um, so our high-tech options are like your Google Classroom, your Haiku, Seesaw, or uh, the, the prepackaged curriculums like uh, Learning A to Z, Unique, uh, Brain Pop, things like that. Um, these are for students that can engage very independently, and a vast majority of your students are going to be able to do this. The ones with special needs, though, might not. Um, some of them will, but many of them will not, and that's where you have to start looking at your low-tech options where you are either sending an email with uh, packets of worksheets to the families for them to print off, or you're printing them off yourself. And I know a lot of you are doing this where you're driving around delivering uh, these packets uh, for the kids that need a more concrete format. And then finally, we've got our next to no tech, where it's the kids that even with that low tech fo uh, format are still having trouble engaging. And most of the instruction is being done face to face through uh, Zoom, through FaceTime, through Google Hangouts, through Teams, um, using cell phones and such. Uh, we've got a teacher later on that will go a little bit deeper into that process. Uh, and then finally, uh, what roadblocks or hurdles can I anticipate? Those of you with a special ed background, 
we're already thinking like this. Uh, but you got to think about what is available to the students at home. Do they have a computer? Do they have internet access? Are they competing with the sibling or with a parent working from home for access to that computer? <clears throat> what kind of family accommodations and modifications do we need to make? Um, some families are just not technologically fluent. So if there's an issue with the technology, the kids can't go to their parents or their family to help resolve it. Uh, some families, the student is the only one in the household that speaks English. So we got to accommodate for that. And then there's some situations where the home is unstable or the student doesn't feel safe going home. And now we're turning around and asking them to do their entire learning process in a location that they just don't feel safe. We need to account for that also. Uh, another big part, especially with the, um, the special ed process is assessment. Um, we all know about uh, the online standardized and normative and criteria based assessments are slowly taking those from paper to online based for simplicity. Um, your prepackaged curriculums like Unique and Learning A to Z will spit out these nice, uh, concise reports that are easy to digest based on uh, lesson progress and how the student is doing. Um, but some things that we've been using uh, more uniquely to us are these informal assessments, uh, the live checks of uh, student progress. So we're sending the packets for the student to work on. And when we're doing our face-to-face -face, uh, sessions, they're holding the papers up so we can spot check it and see what, how that's progressing. Uh, we're also doing these things called video tag checks where we are uh, assigning the student a um, an activity or a skill to demonstrate and we're asking the families to record the student doing that and then send it back to us so that we have visual representation that we can refer back to to gauge progress or regression uh, another aspect that i feel kind of makes uh, us unique is this uh, this magic hour that we are putting on. It is a, uh, a daily, it's one o'clock every day for us, optional lesson uh, that we open up not just to our students, but also to uh, the kids that live on campus with us that don't go to our school, and then the little city community at large. So we've got some of our adult residents that participate in this. Um, and we put on themed days that you can see there at the bottom of the slide. Um, that we, you know, like I said, it's optional, and if you can make it, great. If you can't, we don't hold, hold it against you. Uh, finally, we need to uh, support our staff. Uh, acknowledge the fact it's okay if it doesn't. It's okay if we make mistakes, as long as you learn from it. Making mistakes are part of the success process. Uh, make sure you're sharing your mistakes with each other, though. Don't try to hide behind them. Share them so that we can all grow from it. My dad always told me growing up, it's good to learn from your mistakes. It's better to learn from someone else's. So let's learn from each other's mistakes. Um, Jason was talking about uh, putting staff trainings on these e-learning platform, e platforms. We as staff need to be fluent in these platforms before we can turn around and ask the student to be fluent in these platforms. So we need to support our staff by making sure they have the training that they need. Uh, my job throughout this whole thing has kind of been as an observer and a coach. So I go in and I observe uh, these uh, live lessons and I give feedback and coaching to the, to the teachers afterwards. If we're teaching in a bubble, we're not gonna grow. So having a designated person or a team of people that can go in, observe and give that feedback to teachers to help them grow is going to make this process so much more smooth. And finally, document and record everything. Uh, whether it be the staff trainings that you're doing, uh, feedback, uh, checklists, just writing down, this did not work, I will try this next time. Um, it's going to help for uh, reviewing it if we need a refresher and helping us reflect later on uh, as we get further into this process, um, what's going to be best moving forward. Thank you, Josh. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, Arlen, at this time, would you please, um, and before I introduce our, one of our teachers, Megan Graff, if uh, Arlen, if you'll play the next video. What's your schedule for today, JP? We have calendar, calendar. then uh, literacy, a nice game. And choice time. Cool. So yesterday was Tuesday. Tuesday. Thursday. Tomorrow is Thursday. I love that you're following along just by the click of my mouse. April. April. So 
calendar is mouth time. Mouth time. Do you have enough money? Let's count how much money is in our wallet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Very nice. We have seven dollars in our wallet. How much is this frozen chicken dinner? This one. Is it? Yep, the frozen dinner is six dollars. You have seven dollars in your wallet, and six dollars is the meal. Do you have enough? Yeah. Good job. Way to go, JP Collins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arlen. And taking the screen back. And uh, it's this time, um, Megan Grepp, our, our wonder, one of our wonderful teachers, if you could talk about live instruction and differentiated instruction, please. Hi, hey everybody. How are you? Um, so I'm going to talk about how I kind of run my sessions. Um, first and foremost, I always use a visual schedule, whether that be written out or in picture format to use during my live sessions in my pre-recorded. It provides consistency, a sense of normalcy, back to their normal gear, um, and prepares the student for active engagement and to accomplish what's on their schedule. So it's very important that I use a mixture of both paper-based and digital activities. Um, for my students with higher behaviors and are very rigid, um, especially on the autism spectrum, I noticed that paper-based materials have really helped them. It provides some comfort, predictability, and knowing when to start, the middle, and of course the ending is to finish. Um, since I work in transitions, um, the 18 to 22 year olds, the digital resources have been awesome. You know, I used to do a lot of um, job skills, job training, and community-based instruction. Well, since we can't go on to the community, what we do is we bring the community to them in digital resource format. Um, so they are able to do grocery store job training during those digital activities. Um, it has a big engagement. Um, you do those tag checks. What we do is we do pre-recorded videos of how to do a task, whether that be vacuuming or washing dishes. And then they can do that with a home staff or with a parent um, or even a brother or sister on their own leisure time. So they don't feel constrained um, and you kind of go back and forth for that tag as Ben said earlier. Um, so how to create that active engagement. That's the most important part. When your student is engaged, they are learning. Um, so what I do is I always short, start off with a short gross motor activity. Um, Go Noodle has some really great free ones, so does YouTube. Um, it kind of just sparks their interest to what you guys have going on for that session. The next is you may have to up your enthusiasm a little bit to kind of gear their interest. Um, and next one is using the materials that are geared toward their interest. So I'm able to still do some goal work because my goal work, for example, um, uses their interests. So I have a student who loves Veggie Tales and loves Thomas the Train. So for his goal, it's time on it's time lapse. So I do word problems that are geared towards Thomas the Train and Veggie Tales. So he automatically is engaged and is actually looking forward to doing goal work. I know, right? Um, and the next one is I also use real life objects. So I'll hold up soap and I'll ask, what, do we, what is this for? What is this called? Um, and you can do that from fruits and veggies to cleaning. You name it, you can do it. Um, the next thing I'll talk about is assessment in live time. Um, we all know that Raz Kids is awesome, so is Splash Math, and I use their assessments to kind of gear my live instruction, right? Um, I also do a lot of on-the-spot quick checks to, to see if they're actually getting the material. If they're not, then we will go back quickly and revisit those subject areas. Um, the next and the last thing that I noticed is key, this is critical, is to do those co-teaching moments, right? So bring in your paras, bring in the OT, the speech path, um, the social worker. It is my, it is really how I unlock success. You know, it gets better student engagement and interactions. The students and the teachers and the staff are happier when they see each other. Um, and the most important, it is a, it allows you to adapt for that student on the spot. And that also teaches the family and the home how they can do that in their own time. 
Thank you guys. Hope that was helpful. Thank you very much, Megan. Megan, sorry to interrupt, Phil. We had a quick quick question from Rachel. She said, are you doing those live sessions for each individual student? Correct. Yes. So um, yes. I am, I'm pretty lucky. I, I have seven students in my class. Um, so I do them each individually. And then on occasion, I do some group instructions with the whole class. And I can even do smaller instruction as well. So it goes from one student sometimes to all seven of them. Does that answer your question? That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. And before we move on to Denise Karelko, um, uh, Arlen, if you could show the next video, please. Hi, this is a short instructional video on teaching children how to fold towels. It's very important to use clear, concise directions. We use the same set of instructions over and over. Repetition is key. Smooth tail, pinch corners, match corners. Pinch, Can you? Yeah, pinch Andy. corners. Corners. Good boy. Match corners. Oh, good job. Ready? Turn tail. Turn. Turn. Okay, then what? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Let's go get another one. Big yeah. line. Good job. Big yeah. line down. Jump up. Little line across. Little line across. Whoop. Little line across. Good job. Good job. Thank you, Arlen. And thank you very much, Arlen. At this time, I'd like to introduce Janice Karelko, who is certified as both an occupational therapist and as a speech, as a speech therapist. Hi, everyone. So, um, so for the first slide, we're going to go over how do we then create these live one-on-one -on -one sessions? How do we make them interactive? How do we engage our students? Um, well, Megan was just a great lead in for me um, because like she said, it's really important to do a gross motor activity prior to having them sit at a computer. We want to make sure that their sensory system and their level of attention and they're ready for that. So we have Go Noodle. You can go in to do calming activities. It helps to help them with attention and focus. They also have arousing and alerting activities for the student who needs a little bit more to get you know, up and alert and paying attention. She did a great job using visuals and using highly preferred objects, tying in the veggie tails. You wanna be able to have it interactive. You wanna be able to engage the student and have them wanna participate. Um, and the whole thing about doing the um, remote learning is you really want to have active participation with the students. You want to engage them and have them interested. Um, and definitely co-teaching with other professionals. It really is a great help to watch other professionals, watch their techniques, and to build upon what you know they're doing. And for the next slide, we're going over formal and informal. Right. Formal and informal assessments. So we all know the formal assessments, doing the standardized testing, it's data-driven. Um, and for a lot of the population of the students that we work with, that's not really a really good way to assess our students, especially when you're working remotely. So we do a lot of the informal measures and you get a lot of great information and data from your informal assessments. You can do um, it's content performance driven, you have ongoing information, and as the student is doing the task, it's a great opportunity, like Megan said, to watch the student and if they're making errors to do corrections. And at that time, you can actually see, oh, can I prompt them? What level of prompts do they need? How much assistance do they need to actually do the task and do it correctly? And you can take notes on that and then that can lead to your other information as far as where you're gonna start with that child. It's really, really good to watch other professionals and see how they're working with the child. And it's really good to watch the student, watch for small details, things that you might miss on paper. You can then see watching them informally. 
So we're gonna go over some information for doing pre-taped therapeutic sessions. And we found that if we videotape, it's really good for consistency and teaching the skills. It's great for visual learners and someone who needs to watch it or have it done over and over again. When you have a video for adults, it's a really good way to tape what you want or how you wanna train the student and then the adult or the teachers, whoever you're training in the task with how to do it, they can watch that video over and over. And not only in doing that, it also provides consistent ways of doing a task so that everyone across all environments, school or home, you're all teaching the child the same consistent way and using the same language, which is really important for a lot of the students in our population. Um, it also gives caregiver, caregivers carry over skills that they can take that and work with their child at home. When we're teaching with the students, it's a really good to videotape exactly how you want the child to do the task. And then you could show the videotape to the child. They can watch it over and over again. It's a really good learning tool. And then we go like, so how are we getting to assess this? How can we assess these pre-taped sessions? Well, I find that first, before I even do that, it's good to have a task analysis, breaking down the tasks that you want to certain steps, and then finding out where exactly is that child? Where are they? How much prompting do they need? And then you can actually use your paperwork as your assessment as a checkoff list. So you kind of know, okay, with the child doing this skill, um, they need this much prompting, they need to have this type of visual assistance in order to help them. And then you can share that across with your teachers, your powers, and even the caregivers and parents at home. And then creating paper-based assessments. Um, it's really difficult, I found, working with our population to assess using paper-based assessments, especially online. Um, I found it's really difficult. Like, there's so much information that I know when I want to go and work with a child, but to actually have it up in the sky and get that information and then have it to the computer and then relating to the child and the student and the parent is really difficult. There's a lot of really good online resources. You could use Google Classroom, that's for higher functioning. It actually will then give you scores and it'll grade your work. Um, but I found that more interactive programs, you can use Boom Cards, that's more effective for our population when we're working with children. You can use online resources. Um, I like going back to the task analysis because I have my baseline assessment. Then I can use that going across all the therapy sessions. And then I know, okay, this is where they're improving. Maybe they're not. This is where they need a little bit more help and what to do. I hope that helps. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Denise. Um, Arlen, before, I, before we play the next video, what I'm going to do is just because I think we're going to go a little bit longer, is I just very quickly want to show a, a slide here that, because um, we know that we may lose some people in a few minutes if they have to drop off the call, is that we want to make it clear that if anyone would like to see some of our lesson plans, or any of our of our tape sessions is to uh, please reach out to me directly. Um, Jill Siegel, the principal here at Little City, and my email, which you can see on the slide, is p siegel p s i e g e l at littlecity.org. We'd love to send you just some uh, uh, some samplings of the kinds of things that we're doing here. If you want more information, so just going back, then thank you. And then to go back here is at this time, um, Arlen, if you could play the, the, the final video. Tonight going somewhere without it. So this is where Marvin hopes to go. This is where Marvin you see that? Yeah! yeah. Right. Our shoulders. Shoulders. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. Which one is less? Which one is less? Forty-nine! Nice! Forty-nine! You are for her. I'm happy to see you. You are for her. <laughs> Good job. High five, man. Good job. High five, man.
Think about positive stuff. I love it, Daniel. Think about positive stuff. This is what I'm saying, Daniel. Think about. So. Thank, thank you, Arlen. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce Daniel Collagio, who is both uh, a paraprofessional at our school. Let me share my screen again. I'd like to introduce Daniel Collagio, who is both a paraprofessional at our school and is also an amazing professional videographer who's been able to do so much for so many of us through the amazing videos that he's able to create for us. Thank you so much, Mr. Phil. Uh, I think the video that's been just being um, played, it can it kind of really explain what I'm here to like really uh, encourage everybody. I uh, I know like recording can be a little bit uh, something that we don't like to do, but I would say that if we have the permission of the parents, if you have the permission of the uh, of the student, please uh, don't be afraid to hit that record buttons, uh, because I. Thing, the video, as you see on that video, is just a great way to really show our genuine relationship with them. Uh, it is a good way to see the reflection of them without hiding anything. And this is just uh, a great way. It, it's going to, in the long run, it's going to be a great tool. So we can always like go back and see uh, what are the re, what, what are the things that we do right with the kids and things that we have to really adjust on. And also, I said that. Recording video is just the best way for the kids to see us and for them to see, uh, for us to see them as well. Because uh, I think on the third week of the lockdown, when the uh, before the school closed, so what I did is that I did a compilation of the video and pictures and I put it together and I sent it to the teachers and the therapists. I said like, go play it to the student. Let's see the reaction we get from them. Uh, it's incredible the response we get from them. They are so happy to see uh, the good time that they normally have in the school uh, during the PE time, the CBI, and also some of them, they literally want to put their head in the laptop or in the iPad that they are watching us from because they are just so happy to see us on screen. And the other great reason why we should record is this, it's like as much as we want them to like really uh, all the time give us like a 100 percent accuracy on everything we are teaching them it's like sometimes they already been doing that for us but we don't have something to <clears throat> excuse me we don't have something to show us how well they've been doing because i cannot get tired looking at these children you know smiling their interaction with us you know those good time they are having with us i think the video is just a great way to remind us this genuine relationship we have with them and just like really summarize what i'm trying to encourage if you don't get anything from this um my slide is that if you have a right permission and you have the permission from the guardian and from the student don't be afraid to press the uh, record button because in a long way everybody likes to see how they are growing from a very little child to their adulthood and for them not only to watch their growth like sometimes like if you're a pro professional or your teachers uh it's a good thing to go back watch what you do right watch what they respond better to i think video is just a great way to show that to us thank you so much and join the rest of your time here thank you very much daniel give me a little bit uh i'm sorry and at this time, I'd like to, to bring up uh, Brandy Kelsey, who one of our another one of our teachers. And one of the things that we know from listening to uh, 
the from listening to our fellow IPA members and as well as listening to the news is that it's so difficult in schools that don't have computer access in the homes. And we've developed a process of using cell phone technology, which Randy will talk to you about. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Randy. I was going to talk about what it's like to teach over a cell phone. We've been hearing about principals and even teachers who are delivering paper-based lessons by their cars to hundreds of students. And while that is awesome, and it's so just a great thing to have, it, I found an easier way that has worked for my students. Uh, like, you, like Phil was saying, a lot of our students live on campus, but some of them don't. And some of them are at home and they don't have access to a computer or an iPad or anything like that. Not everyone in their home has a computer, but almost everyone has a cell phone. And if they don't, it's easier to get a cell phone and then versus a computer. It's a lot easier to get a cell phone. So for families who don't have a computer at home, we can still do e-learning and it's still possible. And I have found several ways that have worked for my students. So we do our live time sessions and I do mine over FaceTime, but there's also something called Google Duo. And if you're not familiar with what Google Duo is, it's a way for people who have any type of smartphone, for iPhone and Samsung, um, or Androids or things that are not the same type of cell phone, you can still communicate with your students with the Google Duo app. For this student in particular that's shown in the picture, we use FaceTime um, because we both have iPhones. And on FaceTime, you are able to add people to your calls. Google Duo, you can add up to 12 people at a time. So if we wanted to co-treat with the therapist or even I've had a session with our gym teacher, we are able to co-treat using FaceTime and Google Duo because we're able to add people to our video calls. So it would just be, it would be equivalent to what we're doing with the Microsoft Teams. I just do it on a cell phone. So we do, I do pre-recorded lessons. I'm able to send pre-recorded lessons to my students. And I've also done, I've also taken advantage of the pre-recorded or pre-created curriculum. Uh, as Ben was saying, there's different things that you can use like Google Classroom, Seesaw, but what I have found is successful with my students is Brain Pop Junior because it's also an app that can be accessed through the cell phone. I have all these, um, I just like Ms. Megan was saying, I, I also do a visual schedule with my students. I give them the expectation just like I would in the classroom. We start with calendar, which I do through PowerPoint, which is also an app that I can download on my phone. So I give them, I give them a pre-recorded, the pre-recorded curriculum on Brain Pop, and then we go through the visual schedule and we, we start with calendar, we do our brain pop video, there's different activities that we do, we can do vocabulary, we can do um, a game sometimes, and then we were talk we talked about assessments. Brain Pop Junior has the pre-created assessment tool, and my myself as a teacher, I'm able to go back and see what the students have done. If they log in using their app, I made all of the students' usernames and passwords that they can access on the app and I can go back into their, their dashboard and see what they were doing for the day or what they created through the week. I create all my lesson plans electronically on Microsoft Word and I send those out to the families. And on the Microsoft document, I provide a, pre, a hyperlink for the activity that I'm doing. So if it's Tuesday and we're discussing science today, this week we're doing space. So a student or a family member can click on the space lesson and it'll bring it up on Microsoft Word and it'll connect it to the Brain Pop Junior app. Or they can go directly to the app and access the curriculum that we're doing for the day. So I have found that it is successful to use FaceTime and still be able to reach my students through the use of apps. Like I said, we're using Brain Pop Junior, which also comes in two diff three different languages. You can access it in English, you can do it in Spanish and French. So there's not very many French families, but there are a lot of Spanish speaking families and if we use this app, the app Brain Pop Junior, like Ben was saying, there might be the only student in the house that speaks English. The families might speak another language like Spanish. So this app is, I found, is really, really successful for a multiple multitude of families and learning abilities. So we can use apps and Brain, Brain Pop Junior, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and I'm still able to instruct my students virtually. And we can also record on FaceTime too. So we found that there's an option to record. Daniel talked about don't be afraid to press the record button. This is how 
we're able to continue to go back and view our sessions and learn from our mistakes, see what went wrong, see what went right, and we can share it with the other staff even though we're only just using a cell phone. So I have found that when we think outside the box and think about the students who don't have a, a computer, I have found it very successful to do e-learning through the cell phone. Thank you very much, Randy. At this time, as we, as we think ahead, uh, from the new normal and where we're going from here is I'd like to uh, ask to rejoin us, Jessica Kinji, our, our, our school uh, uh, therapist and clinical coordinator. Wonderful, thank you so much, Phil. So, you know, what are the future implications? And, and as we look at kind of accepting this new norm, we talked about a lot of things and I think we're all coming to slowly realize that, um, Many things may be forever changed because of this pandemic. And, and I urge you to, to um, think that maybe that, that's okay. You know, it has taught us really not to assume um, and it has taught us to continue to think outside the box and outside the four walls of the classroom. You know, we are creatures of habit. And I think sometimes we even become a little bit robotic in the processes when we have students in our school and in our classroom. And this is, this time has really forced us to rethink, you know, this notion of how we've always done things um, from the way we write IEPs and the way we write goals. And it's no longer the assumption that I'm writing a goal because I think I can help this student reach it. It's who's going to be helping me help the student reach it. And I would urge you to keep connecting. Um, you know, closing that distance has been um, something that we have found to be the most useful and beneficial. You know, we're we're kind of in the back seat now, like I said, or we're on the opposite side of a screen. But that does not mean that we can't still have a closeness with our with our teams and with our families. Um, I'd urge you to not lose hope, but do stay real. You know, there are lots of talk about the phases and the predicted timelines and bent curves and social distancing and vaccines, but you know, and we are all hopeful that in time things will go back to normal. Um, but I also would challenge us to think that what if it doesn't go quite like that? You know, there's lots of whispers and discussions that I'm sure we've all heard about how and when we are going to go back. And I, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I wish I could give you some more answers, but I know for sure that it's going to look different. So staying optimistic truly is it, it helps in, in making the process better and us better as, as educators, as therapists, as administrators, um, really taking the time to, to slow down and reflect and see some of the good that's come from this. Um, and so what we learn from a crisis like this, um, perhaps it's, it's new ways that we can push our students or our families or our teams, some things that we might not have seen before. Um, you know, who knew that such distance could bring a learning community such as ours so much closer? And, you know, if we can make it through running a school without an actual school and teaching students without an actual classroom um, and really showing them dedication, you know, in, in time of, of seeming doom and, and all the uh, something as simple as Zoom, I really do think that we you know, our, our heroes to these families and to these students. And I think that if you can take an unexpected crisis and make the most of it, I mean, at the end of the day, that's education at its finest, if you ask me. So thank you so much, Phil. If we wanted to, I also want to know the next slides were really about just looking at the process and benefits of cataloging everything that we're doing. And I know Phil said that if you want any of our videos or need any more information, I know our time has gone a bit over today, please reach out to us. But we found that how important it is in kind of taking advantage of, of saving all of this for a rainy day, and we hope this never happens again, but how we can use what we're doing now, even when we are back in the classroom and in-person learning for our students and also for our staff and using it as a training tool, um, using it for professional development later on um, and in services and institute days. And so truly having an e-learning library, one that's for your students with all of the things that we've talked about, but also one for your staff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Jessica. As you know, we're looking to do a second webinar. We're looking and planning a second webinar for June 2nd. We'd like to conclude, uh, and before we enter uh, uh, question and answer time, is with one third and final poll question, which was, is, is that um, as we move to a, to a second webinar on June 2nd, which of the following would you like to see most? More examples on special education, academic lesson planning, more examples on special education therapeutic lesson planning, more examples on creating an e-learning library for use post-COVID-19, or more examples of how special education e-learning best practices translate into best gen ed learning best practices. The polls are now open. Please vote. And while you're voting, like I say, we just to reiterate that we'd we'd love to to share our 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 findings and our processes with you. And so please reach out to me uh, at Little City at P Siegel P S I E G E L at littlecity.org. Okay. The the poll is here. The poll is in. And it looks like at 37% more examples of special education and academic lesson planning, 12% more examples of special education therapeutic lesson planning, uh, more examples on creating e-learning in the post COVID-19, 26%, and how does special ed e-learning practices translate into gen ed learning, 25%. Great, very interesting and helpful. Thank you so much, Arlen. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'd like to open up now for, for questions. Okay, yes, we've got some questions that already have come in here. Uh, let me... If people have more questions, Arlen, right, they can just uh, continue to write those questions in the, uh, the chat box. That's right. And of course, we have gone a little over our time, so we do understand if you need to log out. Um, and we will, this has been recorded, so we'll make sure to get that to you later. Um, first question from Oris. For students who have multiple interventions, how long are the lessons? And how much work are they expected to complete independently? Very good, great question. Uh, Megan, would you like to address that question? Sure. Um, so a lot of my sessions when they do their work is during live time. Um, my students who have higher behavior needs, I don't do a lot of um, homework or, or computer based that I'm not there for them. So the majority of the work that they do is with me or, a, or another therapist on, on their IEP team. Um, does that answer your question just a little bit, or do you want me to go into more detail? Well, why, don't you, why don't you go just a little deeper? Sure, sure. So um, it's, it's a lot easier to have them do their work when you're right there one-on-one -on -one with them. I've noticed my students really struggled when they had to do the online platforms, such as Reading A to Z or Splash Math sometimes, because they weren't as independent as other learners. So there's ones who are more concrete learners and just need a little bit more guidance and, and a more encouragement. I really have seen success with live instruction and I don't give them too much work outside of that live instruction. Um, and then my, my sessions go from, I sometimes have short sessions that are 15 minutes and then I have sessions that are an hour and a half with other students. So I really gauge it on, and how involved they are and how easy it is for them to follow along through the session. Thank you very much, Megan. So Megan's answer there was from the from the, the academic side. And Denise, will you answer the question from a therapeutic side? Yes. Yeah, so just to make sure I'm clear, could you um, just repeat the question again, please? Yeah, you bet. It's for students who have multiple interventions. How long are the lessons and how much work are they expected to complete independently? Okay, so um, for my students that I work with, they're pretty low functioning, so I really don't expect them to complete a lot of work independently outside of our session. Having said that, if they um, are living at home with their parents and they have like the ability to help and guide them, then by all means, I will like give them some suggestions to do at home. My sessions will go anywhere from maybe five minutes, depending on the student, depending on the day, to up to 30 minutes. Maximum, my sessions are 30 minutes long. That's just based on the students that I work with and their ability to, to attend. And usually I do have, I start with a motor task. I 
maybe take a break in the middle, do another motor task, and then we end the session. Thank you, Denise. Thanks. Uh, next question, please. Okay, next question is from Stephanie. Uh, Hi, how, Stephanie. How, how does special education e-learning practice, tra practices translate into gen ed e-learning? It, um, uh, um, ben, would you like to address that question for Stephanie? Hi, uh, yeah, a lot of the, uh, the concepts that we use for special ed as far as like ensuring that there is a, uh, a visual schedule. So having a gen ed student doesn't necessarily need a visual schedule, but it would help if they had a, a schedule to begin with. Um, just some kind of expectation of what they're going to be doing. Um, making sure that uh, lessons are geared towards their interests will help them with engagement. Um, giving them those, uh, those brain breaks so we use a lot of movement breaks like uh, Denise and uh, Megan were talking about. Um, it may not translate exactly the same way towards a gen ed student, uh, but giving them those brain breaks uh, so that they can kind of reset their focus and reset their concentration. And then like I pointed out in my slide, meeting them where they're at. And um, even though it is a gen ed student uh, that may not have a documented disability, E-learning at home is not the same as e-learning at school. So if they are struggling um, with you pushing out an hour long lesson, it might be better to get a half hour of solid focus than an hour of uh, scattered focus and you're just struggling to get them reeled back in. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Is that I'd like to just to add a little bit to, to that as well to build upon what um, Ben was saying. Is, is that when we look at Danielson framework, the Danielson framework, and we look at engagement in uh, domain three, three C, when we look at in, in engagement, it goes back to where we began the discussion about multiple intelligences, is that we all know that, that, that all children learn within sort of the, the, the basic, uh, within, within, a, the, within certain basic parameters of the eight multiple intelligences. And it really becomes a question where we, where we analyze in a, in a therapeutic setting for the, the best ways that each student learns. The same is directly applicable into general education, is that is spending, is, is you, your staff at your schools have worked so hard and so well uh, all over the state when it comes to learning whether your whether each of your individual students is more of a visual learner whether he or she is a kinesthetic hands-on learner whether she is a auditory learner whether he or she responds better in a one-to-one -one environment in an one-to-one -one environment in the intrapersonal kind of learning or whether it's uh, they they receive they're they're energized and they're and being in a group is more of a catalyst in interpersonal learning or whether music is something that helps them with music is the stimulus that helps them get going or whether they're mathematical kind of things where they're logical thinkers and thinking those things out in that way or whether they're naturalistic kinds of learners where they pull upon some of the wonderful images from nature to govern their learning and so the same process that we do with special education applies directly in, in, into that it really comes down to to breaking down the particular learning style of each particular student and then thinking about what are the best practices to lead into the best methodologies. That's great. Thank you, Phil. Uh, we got time for one more question. This one's coming from Pat. Have you ever used any element of the e-library during the IEP process for parents? And then the answer would be yes to that. But uh, the short answer is yes. Jessica, could you could you respond to that? Hello. Yes. So with regards to our e-learning library, it's something that kind of um, has been put on steroids in this process, I will say. But parts of it we've always had. We have always been um, advocates of finding ways for the students to be involved in the IEPs for those that are able to and those that want to. And so using some of the things that we're doing in the videos and the way that they can showcase their work or unique ways that we've been able to track data in situations where maybe people thought that we wouldn't be able to really meet that goal or measure that goal. And so when we're able to showcase and display some of those things through pictures and videos and actual examples, 
that's where we would bring that into the IEPs. Um, the other part of it outside of the individual students is really if showing parents and families those processes. You know, we get a lot of questions at the IEP table from families with regards to kind of how do I do this or how does this translate to home? And so just as your e-learning training library will be great for your staff or new staff that come in, think about using things like that for your families to show them. Um, when we have a family that's engaged and wants to, to know more, it's a great resource and tool to be able to feed to them as well. And as we, and just to build upon what Jessica is saying as well, is, is that when we think in terms of the e-learning library, it's something that really becomes an electronic portfolio. Many of our schools across the state are moving from uh, paper-based portfolios that are being handed down uh, from teacher to teacher as they move from grade level to grade level, but the ability to create using an e-learning library to create an electronic portfolio that will, that will progress from year to, not just from semester to semester, but year to year for each student for the use both within the school and for, um, for parents to also be involved in the tracking of growth is something that we'll find that in this time that the, these e-learning libraries will become increasingly valuable over time, even when we return back to uh, a whole normal way of, of, of operation. All right. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much to the team at Little City Center for Education. Um, we really appreciate them coming on and sharing so much with us. This has been a, a very hot topic, um, how to do the special education in this distance learning time. And you shared some great strategies with us. So I really appreciate it, Phil. Well, thank you all very much. And it's just a pleasure. Please reach out to us uh, uh, when, you, when you get a copy of the webinar. We'd love to talk to you and we'd love to, to share it as much as we can. We know that this is something that all of us truly are in together. And the more that we can, we can collaborate and communicate from school to school, it certainly benefits all of us. And so we look forward to, to continuing the, uh, the conversation with, uh, with, with as many schools as possible. Thank you. Appreciate that, Phil. And thanks so much to all of our attendees for hanging in there for us. We know this went a little longer, but lots of great information here. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we could share. Um, feel free to close the GoToWebinar control panel, and that will log you out of the session. Take care, everybody, and have a great rest of your evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.